Hi guys, welcome back to Too Cool for Middle School. It's Valentine's Day and I forgot until this morning and uh, yeah, it's been a little crazy. <laughs> I didn't have any Valentine's Day themed lessons or anything and I felt kind of bad this morning like with my first class but every class that has come in since then has been like progressively more sugared and last period we did the whole like carnation passing them out to all the people who got them from a secret admirer and it was madness so I'm like yeah I don't need to add anything to this Anyway, that's why I'm wearing pink and I've got my my heart earrings and that's why my throat hurts because I feel like I've been Yelling all day calling out all the names of everybody who got a carnation and none for Gretchen Wieners Okay, so let's do like a sharp pivot I wanted to talk to you guys about how I use Swing kids to introduce the Holocaust as we go into our Anne Frank unit this is something that I've talked about on Instagram for like years and I always said that I was gonna make a YouTube video and I never have so we are we are sitting down to do it right now. Sorry if you can hear lots of hyper students outside of my window. It's lunchtime and they all had a lot of chocolate. Okay, so I'm gonna go through this resource that I have on Teachers Pay Teachers and just kind of like talk a little bit about why I use this and the impact that it has on my classes and why it works well with the Diary of Anne Frank. So I teach eighth grade English and within our textbook we have the play version of the Diary of Anne Frank. We have the collections curriculum from HMH and so that's just you know something that eighth graders do every year. And the story is always so powerful. Like maybe for people our age it's something that we've heard so many times and we know the story and we know a lot of details about the holocaust but sometimes i forget that like with each eighth grade class that comes up they don't know all that much about world war ii they don't know all that much about the holocaust or anne frank um i feel like they know a little bit less than like i did as an eighth grader maybe just because we're moving further and further away from World War II and we, we know less people who actually lived through it or something. I'm not really sure why, but um, yeah. So even when I feel like, you know, I've, I've done this a lot, I'm always reminded of how powerful it is for my students. So um, in the past, I've just like kind of done some historical background information about the Holocaust and World War II and then we go into Anne Frank and the most common question that students ask is like, how did this happen? Like, how did so many people agree to support Hitler and to do these evil things? Like, the magnitude of sheer evil is really hard to comprehend. How did so many people agree to run these concentration camps, to sell out their neighbor, to give information to the Nazis? How did you even decide to become a Nazi? How did people agree to join this organization and to drag people out of their homes and to take them to these camps and to put them into gas chambers and to kill them and to invent something that would burn their bodies so that the neighbors nearby would stop complaining about the stench of dead body when they knew what was going on. Like, it's just mind boggling. And that's only the tip of the iceberg, but just to, to think about the, the sheer magnitude of the evil that was the Holocaust. So I found that using Swing Kids as an introduction because it's set before World War II, like during the rise of the Nazi party and the rise of Hitler, it helps us to see a little bit of how people could have been, you know, convinced to join this party and convinced to participate in Hitler's final solution, um, even if they didn't necessarily fully agree with it, but just for the safety of their families, for the safety of themselves. And this just helps to explain a little bit of how things could have gotten so, so bad. And it really serves as a warning to us today as well. So Swing Kids is a movie that was, I think released in like 1993. 
I remember seeing it as a young kid, probably too young because I remember the scene with Arvid very vividly and I remember crying and my uncle was like teasing me for crying during that scene. Um, but it really did get me interested in learning more and more about World War II. So the general idea of the movie, it's about these three teenage boys who live in Germany. It's not necessarily based on real characters, but it's based on like a true group of people who existed at this time. So there were these kids who called themselves swing kids and they really enjoyed swing dancing and jazz music and like British fashion and they wore their hair kind of long and they were kind of just like rebels, you know? They didn't want to join the HJ, which is um, the Hitler Jugend or the Hitler Youth, which is kind of like the Boy Scouts under Hitler. And it's like a, a Nazi, pre-Nazi training group. And we'll get into that a little bit more in a minute, but um, it follows these boys and their decisions and their motivations and their situations leading up to World War II. So it just fits well before Anne Frank because for one, like you kind of get to look at boys her age at that time and Germans her age at that time. So you're getting two perspectives and I feel like that's important because when we do read Anne Frank, like it's from a very limited perspective because she's literally inside the annex the whole time and it's a little bit difficult to get a sense of what is happening outside and what else is going on in the world. So I feel like this is a good introduction into that. So what I have my students do is first we do just like a little bit of vocabulary because there are a few words that come up fairly often that they might not know. So the Gestapo, for example, and that is like the Nazi police and they're keeping an eye on everybody at this time, making sure that everybody is loyal to the fatherland and loyal to Hitler. And then there's the HJ like we talked about and this is kind of like the Boy Scouts version of the Nazis for younger boys. Um, they mention Benny Goodman pretty often because he's the king of swing. He's like their favorite musician. And it's important to note that he's Jewish. So swing music and jazz music was being outlawed in Germany. And a big part of that is because so many of the musicians are black and Jewish. And then lastly, the Fuhrer. So they uh, refer to Hitler quite often in the movie, but he really doesn't appear as a character but he influences so much of what happens in the movie. So it's just important to like talk about his rise to power a little bit. So as we watch the movie, we kind of do three things at once. So one of them is just looking at the three main characters. So Arvid, Thomas, and Peter. We look at their character traits, their family and home life, and then their vulnerabilities and weaknesses. These vulnerabilities and weaknesses are important because this is a way that the HJ, or the Gestapo is able to kind of manipulate them into doing what they want. So um, Arvid, for example, has a limp. So that's gonna be very significant because the Nazis targeted not just Jewish people, but also anybody with a disability, anybody with a mental illness, anyone who was gay, if you were deaf, blind, a Roma, or a gypsy, as they would have said back then. Um, and it depends on how much you wanna get into this, but like the whole, science of heredity and genetics was really exploding at this time and being used to justify genocide uh, because people did not want these traits to be inherited. So even before people were taken away and sent to, to concentration camps, they were sterilized. And part of Hitler's final solution was um, just eradicating the undesirables from reproducing and just creating like this master race. So that's important to note. Um, and then like for Thomas, he doesn't get along well with his parents. He's kind of a vindictive guy who's always will willing to fight and this is gonna be important later on. And then Peter's father was taken away by the Nazis earlier on and so, you know, he's got a single mom. He's trying to protect his own family and so those are the things that the Nazis are gonna take advantage of. On the next page, I have them just list any interactions that the three characters have with the HJ, just to see how they change throughout the movie. So with Arvid, they become increasingly, increasingly violent and contentious. With Thomas, he is so against the HJ at the beginning, and then in the end, you'll see that he really falls for all of their propaganda and is very much a part of the HJ. And then for Peter, as much as he tries to resist 
the HJ and the Gestapo, it becomes increasingly hard for him to do that. So um, this is a good way just to kind of like track that throughout the movie. And then I also have plot notes where they just answer questions that are in like sequential order. I also include in the little packet that I made for Teachers Pay Teachers a fast forwarding guide because I think this movie is rated PG-13 and there are some things that just like, you know, aren't really acceptable to show in class. There are some boobs. They have a picture of like a 1930s topless woman. I just, you know, mute my screen for that part. Um, they say some bad words. The, the F word is in there once. They say bastard a couple times, and then they have um, racial epithets in there, um, like for black people and for Jewish people. And I mean, you, you just decide like what you're comfortable with showing, but it's, you know, how Nazis would have spoken. And then the part that I always make sure to fast forward is the scene where Arvid does commit suicide in a bathtub. He slits his own wrists, and it's just a very vivid scene. And if it's something that you would, not want in your mind it, it's hard to it's hard to get out of your mind so if you just like I can mute my screen for about 20 seconds and then the next scene is his funeral so like they get the point and I tell them what happens but it's just it's it's a image that not every kid might want in their mind and it, it's tough to to remove it if you didn't want it there so I don't feel like it's fair to like subject every kid to seeing that if you have older students, if they're like in high school, maybe you'll feel differently. But for eighth grade, I just, I don't show that and they, they still get the point. A lot of the questions have to do with like the propaganda that the boys are receiving through their HJ training. The way that they present Jewish people, the way that they talk about the economy, the way that they talk about how these boys are superior to everyone and they should be fighting for the fatherland. And it um, actually right before we did this, this is English class, but it definitely has like a historical bent to it because I'm a historian as well. But um, we had read this excerpt from the Skylark's War about World War One, which was like excellent. And so we did talk about how after World War One, there were so many missing people in society. Uh, there were so many fathers who had died, so many brothers who had died. Um, everyone's economy was kind of depressed after World War One because uh, a lot of the men who had been in all these various industries were dead. Millions of people died. And of course, Germany lost World War I, and so they had a lot of like sanctions on them, a lot of consequences for their actions in World War I. And so as Hitler is rising to power, there is a very depressed economy in Germany, and people are looking to somebody to help them. And a lot of people, you know, have no husband anymore, have no father anymore. So they are very desperate for a new leader that's going to uh, lead them out of the situation that they're in. And they still have loyalty to their country. So as you'll see in the movie, um, the boys who join the HJ, it's a very proud thing for their families. Their families are proud to see them in their uniforms. They're receiving all of this training. They get to go on camping trips that their parents probably can't afford to take them on. Um, they are very physically fit. They do like boxing lessons and they run. They get a lot of privileges. Um, they can get free stuff like bikes and motorcycles. So if you are maybe a single mother like Peter's mom, for one, it helps to you know rid your family of any suspicion if you if one of your sons is in the hj that makes your family look very loyal to germany and so it's a safety issue but also they're just receiving a lot of things that you can't really give them and so a lot of families encourage their boys to join the hj and to be a part of it and then once you're an adult and you graduate then you can join the gestapo and become a nazi and the movie just shows how difficult it is to resist even for germans so i think this is an important thing for kids to see as well that um, th there's really not much of a Jewish perspective in this movie. It's more just through the eyes of Germans. And so um, even their own freedoms are very limited by the German government. They're not allowed to listen to the music that they want. They're not allowed to say the things that they want. They cannot criticize the government. Wearing your hair kind of shaggy and long as a boy um, is something that could get you in trouble or like facing suspicion you can't dance the way you want they have to like switch over to folk dancing 
um, when they're you know dancing in their secret swing clubs and everything and so it kind of shows that like in order to oppress a certain group of people even if you think you're not that group of people we're all gonna feel the oppression in some way in order to like maintain that power so this whole unit works really well with the teaching tolerance social justice standards talking about privilege talking about freedoms and acknowledging that it it can be difficult to stand up to a regime and it can be difficult to see these little things as they begin so if you acquiesce and acquiesce and you know in the case of world war ii like all of the surrounding countries were practicing appeasement with Hitler, right? So he's taking over Austria, and they're like, oh, okay, well, and then he takes over Czechoslovakia, oh, okay, takes over Poland, and um, as you let little things go and let it go and let it go, it becomes much harder to resist later on once uh, the situation is so much more intense. So you're able to see that through this movie. You're also able to see people who um, have an underground resistance. So his father, we don't know exactly what he did, but he was part of the underground resistance at like the university where he worked and defending Jewish people. And then the bookstore where Peter works, it's clear that the bookstore owner is um, using books as a way to transport like um, forged documents, probably for Jewish people to like get out of Germany or maybe they're like false birth certificates or just anything that they would need in order to keep them safe. And so um, he's transporting those to the woman whose husband was a colleague of his, of his father. I can't remember her name at the moment, but there are people who are um, just kind of secretly resisting the Nazis. And so you do see that like, like with Peter, he kind of outspokenly resists the Nazis in the end. And he's, you know, like swing kid or die, <laughs> but it's not necessarily effective so he in a sense really fails in his resistance to the nazis and then thomas fails because he becomes a nazi and arvid loses as well he understands that um there's not a future for him in germany so it's a very depressing movie um on like rotten tomatoes it gets a really low score like there are a lot of people that really don't like this movie i guess maybe for adults they think it's like too cheesy but i think it actually is very good for teenagers I think the acting is really good. Like it's Christian Bale. It's the guy from uh, House. The acting is really good and like the costumes are good. The music is great. I have a lot of um, band kids who really like the music. I actually taught my kids how to like do the Charleston so that we could dance when there's like the swing dancing scenes. So there's a lot that you can do with this. And um, I think it took us about like three class periods to get through. Maybe we had to like wrap it up on a fourth class period. and. Um, we had a lot of discussions about it and just really talked about what we would do in those situations. And um, one interesting conversation that we had, and I include these discussion questions, is like about the mom. Uh, she's a single mom and there's like a Nazi that clearly is like interested in her. Um, and so it feels like she's selling out when she like lets him come over for dinner and bring them food and entertain them. Um, but what other option does she have? Like if she turned down his offers, what would have happened to her? So I think it just helps to see um, how difficult the situation was in Germany and just to see how people would have either been eager to join the Nazis or like reluctantly joined the Nazis, feeling like they had no other choice and how it, it was hard to resist. And this is not to let anybody off the hook, but it's just to provide some context for how things got so, so bad. So that when we read the diary of Anne Frank, we understand how dangerous the situation was. And like the kids always ask like, why didn't people just leave? And so like Anne Frank's family does leave. They go to the Netherlands. They're able to kind of tell early on in Hitler's reign that it's not gonna be safe for Jews in Germany. So they move to a whole other country, but then he takes over that country as well. Oh, and then they ask like, why didn't they just try to move to America? And so there's a lesson on Listen Wise that goes into the history of how they did try to come to America and we rejected their pleas for asylum here. And so there are a lot of modern day connections and there's a lot that you can do to kind of turn this around on us and think about how we would truly respond in these situations. It's very easy to hate Nazis. Of course we hate Nazis. You can blame them all you want, um, but 
if we were in that situation, really, truly, what would we do? And I keep on having coughing fits, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think I am getting sick. It's a Friday. It's been a long week. We have a three-day weekend coming up. Other teachers on a Friday afternoon, you probably recognize this condition, this situation. So I'm gonna end it here. I was gonna talk a little bit more about um, how we move into Anne Frank, but I think I'll just make a separate video about that, about how we teach Anne Frank. Um, there's so much you can do with it, and there are so many different ways to approach it, I think. And what our focus has been this year is really focusing on the concept of privilege, thinking about Meep and Mr. Crawler. We do the play version, so that's, sometimes they have different names, you know, like in the play and in her diary. Um, and just looking at what it means to be brave enough to be scared and to be burdened with trying to keep your own family safe and yet still helping people who are less fortunate than you and who have less privilege than you. And again, we're using the social justice standards kind of as our framework to go through this. So I'll make a, another video about that Ugh, when I'm feeling a little bit better. <sighs> Ugh, I need something to drink besides coffee, clearly. So I will link this resource down below if you're interested in using that with your students. Let me know if you've seen this movie. I think it's good. If you hate it, okay, I guess you agree with most people. <laughs> but I like it a lot and I think that my students really benefited from seeing things from that angle. All right, I hope this video was helpful to you. I will see you in the next one. Have a great week, bye.